What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the podcast. It's been a while. Stoked you're still here. Stoked you're still tuning in. Stoked you're still excited to learn and absorb all the knowledge we're dropping on here. I have Topper of Good Fair on the show today. Topper is a G. He thinks bigger than most people. He's looking to do something grander scale. Good Fair is an online thrift store of sorts selling bulk bundles to the masses on a huge, huge scale out of Texas. So uh, it's interesting to see how he's put his own spin on the vintage and thrift game and uh, really dove into it in a different perspective than most of us. So lots of good info in here. Check it out. Uh, you know, appreciate all the support, guys. If you want to support, you can check the Patreon. You can go buy something from EffersonFrankVintage.com. Links are below. Or just go buy something through that Amazon link. I hate Amazon, but, you know, I get my cut. So if you're going to buy shit on Amazon anyway, I get my cut. Without further ado, let's get into the episode. Okay, so welcome to the show, Topper. Super stoked to have you. Uh, obviously, you're in your Dude, you're I'm in your so office. Stoked. You can see the fucking factory behind you. Um, I'm I'm excited to chat because you have a different type of business than most people. You have a larger business than most people, but you did something that no one really did, which was created an online thrift store of sorts. You sell only really bundles. You're selling to like a broader yeah. audience. You're really like pushing uh, sustainability with like the young consumer base. So um, yeah, I'm super stoked to get into it. Hell yeah, me too. There's so much I want to say, so much I want to hear about all that stuff. And I love talking to the vintage community. <laughs> nice. All right. So let's just let's kick it back to the beginning. Uh, you've been getting a lot of press lately. Congrats on yeah. all the press you've been getting. That's pretty sweet. You're like on Thank the news. Thank you so and- much. It is such a bless. Yo, local, um, local Houston press. I was on the Today Show with Oda. Where are you at? What up? No way. Uh, you know, so I'm really <laughs> trying to, yeah, really trying to uh, be the Pied Piper of, of this uh, sustainability mission. But ironically, you know, I was thinking – uh, I'm just going to keep talking, but uh, I was thinking yeah, yeah. I need to tell the truth about how I got into this because like the good fair narrative has just always been sustainability, sustainability, sustainability. But you know what? I was just like, wait a second. I've been saying that because that's the freaking uh, you know, seize du jour, but I've been doing this yeah, for so totally. long. I've been doing this before the planet was a thing. I mean, it was a thing with like hippies, like save the whales and shit, but like it wasn't, you know, part of the mainstream when I was doing this. I was doing this, A, because I had no moolah, like most of the, uh, you know, vintage sellers. And then I also, so to bring it way the fuck back, I had a, a, a shirt brand. I was making polo shirts. And I was making them over in the Dominican Republic and in uh, Pakistan. And, uh, and then I ended up making them in Queens, New York. I was living in New York City at the time. That's neither here nor there. But um, when I closed that business, I realized in factories, I was not the person to, like, stand over uh, people in factories to, like, fix little details of the clothing. And if you give these factories an inch, they will take a mile, meaning like you need to stand over them because they're always looking to cut corners for time or like they don't understand what you're trying to do or whatever, whatever, whatever. Like there'll be inconsistencies out the wazoo. Like when I got into So you're saying like that job, you're saying like you couldn't really 
that job just didn't vibe with you. You didn't like it. It was too, it wasn't your thing. I'm saying I couldn't, I, I realized when I closed that business, I was like, yo, I, after it was so painful, I was like, I never want to make another motherfucking thing in my life. Basically because there are enough people out there that are making new shit. Everybody and their mama's making a fucking clothing line. And I thought, like, I can do that too. And I was so freaking bad at it. So I was like, yo, I'm going to try to sell some used shit. Uh, like, that's kind of I was like, I'm going to hustle used cars. I sold used cars for a minute. Um, but that's how I got into vintage. And basically, like, so now we're in, like, 2008. And uh, so we're in 2008, and I um, realized that, like, I kind of, like, really, I got into it because I wanted to, to, like, impress chicks. Like, I always liked girls who wore, like, leather jackets and, like, beat-up jeans. I was like, yo, let me try to get some fucking beat-up jeans, a mint t-shirt. Mm. I'm going to try to, like, <laughs> find out where vintage stores get their shit. So I'm like... First of all, any youngins out there thinking that, uh, you know, getting into vintage will get you laid. I mean, maybe like I had, to, you know, it's been OK, uh, but, you know, I've had to develop other tactics. I'm just selling vintage. So let me tell you, I'll tell you that for free. But um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, lo I love this direction we're taking here because it is true. Like the, the like you say, good fair is all about. Uh, you know, all about sustainability, which I think is such a bullshit word anyway, but it's, it's, it's good to get the truth because the tr I've told this truth too. Yeah. Like it never started with us in that realm at all. It started as like, it's it cool it's and like there's gold. money in it, you know? Exactly. Um, and, and yeah, maybe it'll get you laid and you get to hang out with celebrities sometimes and like all that other cool shit that goes along with it. Right. So <laughs> Dude, that's how, that's how I started. So what happened was, this is a long-winded story, but basically what happened was I started, I was living in Brooklyn or no, I, at that time I was in the Lower East Side where you were. And I was like, um, just hustling to pay rent. And I went into some, you know, vintage stores and asked them where they got their stuff. And like, yo, they got pissed. I was like, damn, someone's hiding something here. Um, so... The, the, just the visceral reaction that I got from, from the people working at these stores, like, what do you mean? Where do we get our stuff? I'm like, okay, wow, Jesus. Um, so that's what caused yeah. me to start digging. And then I found a rag house uh, to buy vintage at. And Where right, is so this basically one? I went to this rag house. So that was Trans Americas in New Jersey. I don't know if you guys know that one. I'm banned from that one. Eric Steuben, I love that guy, but he doesn't love me. Uh, they, you know, they introduced me to the game, kind of. Um, well, you know, you never know how you, you might ruffle someone's feathers. So if I ruffled your feathers and you're out here listening, I'm sorry. I'd love to talk about it over a brew. Um, but... <laughs> yeah, that shit happens. It's unavoidable in this business. And uh, yeah, you're not alone there. So. Yeah. Totally, totally. So, uh, so I went to that and then started selling vintage. Uh, and then I started like, what gave me a really good big break a doodle was, oh no, yo, this is a crazy wild story. Actually, it's almost like too painful to relive, but I'll do it. Yeah, so, let's get into it. I always, I always had the vision of like creating an, a large scale online thrift store and I have fucked up so many times doing this because like, yo, um, I've just lost. So I, I think I might be the money losing world champion after thread up, but like, at least they've been able to kind of put the pieces of the puzzle together. I'm like still fucking Helen Keller in this bitch. <laughs> Trying to put these pieces together. <laughs> So, oh man! Uh, basically, I started this other uh, vintage store, an online thrift store called uh, Nifty Thrifty, and okay. like what I was doing with that one was I was selling one-off pieces, but with that I was trying to be fashion. And because I was living in New York and I was like, all right, yo, I'm going to try to like, 
I don't know, try to be fashion. And that was like when I realized like, yo, top doggy, T diggy, do not try to be fashion because like, it's just an, it's just a fickle like world of like Anna Wintour and like, I don't know, like journalists that are just, I'm not never going to quote unquote get it. So like, don't pretend to get it. So that took me two or three years to, to realize. Uh, and I also, that's how I kind of developed the mystery bundles because what I realized uh, after uh, Nifty Thrifty was that everyone was is fighting over the same shit and I'm never going to be able to get the stuff that some rich guy in Japan is fucking, you know, has 50 people in a rag house picking, you know, and paying top dollar for. And I'm just some yuts with no money. And like, I don't like sifting through t-shirts enough to fucking get the good t-shirt. I'm just not going to win like that. So I was like, all right, I got to, I got to invent something else because, uh, that ain't for me. So I started doing the mystery bundles with nifty thrifty. I closed that. And then I started doing some, like, I had something very blessed happen. Um, Budweiser hollered at me when I was doing Nifty Thrifty. So one day, one fine day, one sweet, sweet day, I was walking in Soho with my chica. And we were, I get a phone call from a random number in Canada, uh, BTW. And... This number was like, yo, are you Topper from Nifty Thrifty? I was like, yeah. Yeah, what's up? I was like, all right, who the fuck do I own money to now? Like in Canada. <laughs> How the hell do I own some money to someone in Canada? And, so, <laughs> and well, uh, we, ne- we never let it go, man. You know, Canadians don't let it go. We're coming after you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yo. So, <laughs> so he goes, hey, just curious. Um, if I needed to get, uh, a thousand, uh, outfits authentic from the 1970s in two weeks, uh, is that something you could get for me? And I was like, yeah, if someone paid for it, like, yeah, I could figure out a way to do it. And then I was like, okay, cool. Thanks. Click hung up. I was like, yo, to my girlfriend at that time, I was like, that was the weirdest fucking thing I just happened. Someone just wanted a thousand like seventies pieces. Um, and I never heard from them. I didn't hear from them for like a week. Then that number calls again. And the, he was like, Hey, uh, my name is blah, blah, blah. I'm going to send you an NDA. Uh, and then I'll tell you more about what I was asking about. So I fucking signed the NDA. I did. I read it hell to the no. Cause I signed <laughs> away my fucking first kid. I don't fucking know. I'll just sign that shit. <laughs> so oh, that's this oh, long God. ass thing. <laughs> uh. So I fucking signed the NDA, and then um, next thing I know, it's Budweiser, and they're doing this fucking thing called Up for Whatever, and uh, basically they needed a thousand suits. I mean, a thousand outfits from the nineteen seventies, and they ended up paying me a hundred grand for that shit. Um, so nice. did I buy a house? Did I fucking, uh, you know, it was amazing by the way. That was an um, amazing event. All this shit. Like, you know, Snoop Dogg was there. It was in random, like a crested Butte, Colorado or the first one. There were two of them, but yeah, it was unbelievable. Unbelievable. And I ended up netting like the first kind of real money in my life. And I fucking went and bought a Porsche. And the next thing you know is... This I guy, come paper. on. <laughs> I'm doing donuts and I fucking blew the engine. <laughs> yeah, you're like, you're like Budweiser's going to call me again next week and I'll make another hundred grand. It's no big deal. <laughs> yeah, yo, and they did. <laughs> they did? <laughs> yeah, they fucking did. <laughs> but I blew that money too. <laughs> oh, and they stopped on. doing the up for whatever thing. Uh, <laughs> I started do- so that was incredible. They did that uh those incredible events and uh I'm still friendly with the people that uh 
put those events on. It was really, really incredible. And that um, allowed me to kind of do some wardrobe for some TV and movies and just like all that time now I'm like living in New York and like I'm seeing now I'm building up to the kind of uh, the, the evolution of good fare of like how that's yeah. happened, right? So I'm seeing the fucking what I like to call the Warby Parkerization of everything. Of like, yo, you got a mattress, so fucking throw a Warby Parker brand on it. Casper. It's like, yo, you got a fucking makeup, let's do a glossier. And it's all the same branding. It's all the same exact fucking branding agencies giving the exact design. Yo, it's the co- let's make the Warby Parker a fucking coffee mugs and raise a hundred million dollars and fucking go. And that was the time. That was like five or six years ago. Like shit was popping up. And like, yo, it's like, yo, the coffee mug Warby Parker just IPO just got fucking bought for a billion dollars because fucking the CAC was the LTV in your mother's ass. I was like, yo, what the fuck is going on over here? I got to fucking be able to connect these dots. <laughs> So, <laughs> so, oh, <man. laughs> so the next thing you know, I'm like, yo, I got to fucking, I got to get in on this racket somehow. So I'm thinking like, all right, Nifty Thrifty had some good like mystery bundles that was going well. Um, and what happened was basically... Uh, I was like, how can I Warby Parkerize thrift? Like, cause you really, the thing is with this vintage community, God love you all. I hope you're listening. Uh, no one ever wants to build a brand. Everything's around, yo, grandma's fucking dusty, fucking vintage love. And I don't even, I'm trying to, I'm not saying like real men, because if I say one fucking funky ass name, it's going to be someone out there. So you guys get it. The names of the vintage brands are not brands that people want to buy into. It's too mom and pop. And that has its benefits, of course. But like, if you're trying to build an enterprise, you can't be fucking doing that shit, you know? So yeah, I talk about this a lot on the show and I think people need to understand that it's that like, you have to think, big you have to think into the future you can't think like today i gotta sell a few t-shirts it's like to build a brand to build yes. something you know to be to be sellable potentially or be something that people want to invest in you have to start with that in mind like kind of what you're saying is like you had that vision right from the beginning um because it is you know it's possible but it's most of the vintage community is not set up that way and it can never be scaled or never be sold. And like that, that that's uh, like, it's not that you always want to like, you don't have to sell, but to build something that you can sell kind of sets you up for success in the first place. Cause it allows you to like have it all lined up in a better way, branding, better systems. You know what I'm saying? 1000%. And you're right. You don't have to sell, but that is how wealth is created. So, you know, we talk in the community a lot about, you know, game. Yo, you want to share game. It's like, yo, sharing game. It's like you got the only, the biggest way to make wealth in this country or in this modern world is to build equity in something and liquidate that equity. That is how kind of wealth is transferred. And, you know, by golly, I want every, the pie is infinite. You know, I'm reading all these, you know, kooky books of, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, think you grow rich and the science of getting rich and all that shit. Um, you know, I got the fucking Baba Ramdas up my fucking, you know, all the time. Let's um, go. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. But, like, uh, you know, it's. You you have to be thinking in that uh, you know in that in that vein of of um, there is infinity infinite wealth out there and uh, you know it's and it's possible to to get your share of it you know and I see some incredible things in this industry and I just want to share what I've learned so that's that. Um, Okay, where the hell was going with that? Oh, yeah, yeah I have so a you're... funny little story of how good oh, how good fair was kind of evolving. So I was like, "Yo, how in baby Jesus's name does like how does how do you kind of 
Warby Parkerized thrift. And by, or again, just to reiterate what I mean about Warby Parkerizing, it's like throw like some sexy branding and create a direct to consumer uh, uh, platform for this. Well, I realized with Nifty Thrifty to be, you know, I didn't want to do one off stuff. And I thought that the mystery bundles uh, could have some legs. Um, but I thought, like, okay, if we're going to name this business, it has to sound and feel like all these other venture backed foofy brands out there, whether I don't know, Gen Z, millennial, all this shit. It's like, really, it. That even wasn't even going through my head. It was like, you have to appeal to coastal elites because that's who's investing. And so I was like, all right, well, coastal elites, they're wearing all birds. They're, they're, where, they're eating at Sweet Green. They're shopping at Ever Lane. I was like, yo, that's what I fucking, it's got to sound like that. I was like, all right, so I put a bunch of one syllable foofy words together and uh, – Good fair uh, also became a double entente because of the fair is you know closed, but also it was a fucking domain name I could afford. I I was I was literally you know selling Mazda Miatas in the fucking Bronx, like hustling shit on Craigslist and shit uh, to buy this fucking domain name. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, was was actually, Good Fair ran you, as a as a business before that? Like, did you have to buy somebody out of the name? No, no, no. It was just some guy in Russia that owned it. And he owned, uh, um, I think, I think he still owns the Twitter handle or something like that. I couldn't get it from him, but, uh, uh, yeah, I think I paid like $3,200. Like he wanted 10 grand or something. And I somehow scratched together three grand and got it to him and, you know, started doing it. So the the concept of this was always to always to think bigger, always to think like, oh, yeah, how can this appeal Ex to the market? Exactly. So, OK, so then. So I'm still living in New York at that time, and uh, I knew that I had a little I, I had like a little, little kind of storage space where cheap ass warehouse space outside of the city. Uh, to kind of get the business rolling off the ground. And I realized, like, yo, if I'm going to do this, i got to be in Houston, Texas. That's where all the used clothing uh, textile recyclers are. So, like, you know, all the rag houses, I always like to say this, like, are, you know, huge amount of America's waste uh, goes to Houston uh, to, to be exported across the globe. So I was like, yo, i got to be in Mecca. Um, so I didn't know anyone. I moved into a $500 a month, you know, all inclusive, like shithole apartment, uh, to, this was now 2019. It's so only a couple of years ago and, uh, just started just hacking away and, and, you know, wheeling and dealing with rag houses and, um, really, you know, scaling up this mystery bundle, uh, you know, concept because the whole concept. So now that I, you know, it's shared the kind of genesis of the naming uh, and the branding, basically the, the concept behind the, the product was how do you deliver a great product experience, but not lean on the brand that, uh, not lean on the brand that it was originally and kind of flip the script and say, okay, once it comes through our doors, it becomes our brand. And that kind of is, in my opinion, the future of thrift, because if everyone really is going secondhand first and sustainable, we can't all be fighting over, you know, fucking some random Ralph Lauren uh, you know, yeah. polo bear or some shit. That's so smart. And that's such a good point because it is still, there's still so much onus on what it is. It's like, you know, we all tote that thrift is saving the planet or we tote that it's, it's, you know, don't buy fast fashion, all these things, but people still want to look cool and they, they still are gravitated towards certain things. So it's like, you know, that's, that's kind of where we came in with, the reworking and, and all that too, but also still people s are so gravitated towards like Nike or Adidas or like Ralph Lauren and, you know, being able to make it your own and have it be good, fair, have enough of a name that it, it's, it's like, they're speaking that as 
Like, you know, it's that whole branding synonymous with, um, like Kleenex is a tissue, but everybody calls yes. it a Kleenex and Kleenex is a brand. If they were like good fairs thrift and you <sighs> have that is in your vocabulary, that's like the ultimate, uh, brand awareness. That's the goal. That's, that's the ultimate goal. And, you know, praise Allah, hopefully we get there. Uh, but you know, we're just putting one foot in front of the other. And even if good fair doesn't do it, someone's going to do it. And, you know, if we just keep putting that philosophy out there, if that it could be, you know, my contribution to this industry, then God bless. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so the concept run us through, you know, you've, you've kind of spoke about it now, but run us through like, yeah deeper concept of, of good fair. So you, it, you, you sell online, it's all bundles. How does it work exactly? Yeah. So we buy the bales that you can see behind us and we buy them by category. So basically it's like, you know, we got the t-shirts, we got the printed t-shirts, solid t-shirts, um, you know, crew neck sweatshirts, hooded sweatshirts, all these sort of things. We've experimented with many different categories. We've experimented with about 150 different categories and we've whittled it down to like 30 because last October we had about 130, uh, uh, categories on the site and they were all selling, but customers don't come back for the, uh, the majority of them. And we couldn't deliver a great experience because the unpredictability around a lot of the products. So like, I'm putting dresses on there. Yo, you want a mystery bundle summer dress or some shit? I'm not going to say we won't ever do it again, but like the, there's just too much unpredictability in the bales we're receiving as far as the size and things like that. So we're sending, you know, five dresses to someone who's not happy with any of them. And yeah, they got them for a good price, but it, it, it's just, it wasn't the best way to do it. So we've whittled it down to the, the, the products that have, an enormous amount of predictability, meaning like a printed sweatshirt, a fucking printed t-shirt, a, a solid t-shirt. I'm wearing good fair. You know, the kid doesn't stop. And <laughs> like all these things around, uh, just that are very, very basic. And then, um, so basically you come to the site and you, you know, say you want some medium flannels, and we send you two medium flannels and we size them up. We wash about 15%. We got a big ass washing facility. My water bill is, you know, uh, I'm a big, you know, supporter of the town of Houston. Let's just say that. And, you know, just uh, <laughs> like, you know, trying yeah. to deliver the best experience possible. And I've learned a lot of lessons kind of experimenting with it. It's, uh, yeah, it, that's a good point. You say like predictability within the bales, or, or I guess not even so much the bales, but in the in the category, it's predictability in the categories themselves, right? Because like dresses, like you said, there's yes. variability. It, there's a hundred different styles of dresses, thousand different styles of dresses, all fit differently, different yeah. hip sizes, bust sizes, all these things, lengths. Whereas like t-shirt is a t-shirt is a t-shirt and you can make it, uh, they, they understand what they're going to get a lot easier. Right. And then exactly. they'll come back for that. And we've found that too in wholesaling, you know, uh, but also oh, in, yeah. like trying to create, because again, with what I've done, Frankie's obviously a very different business model, but we also try to like, so we, we call them uh, static products. We have one offs, but that's like super hard and laborious to sell. And then we have statics where like yep. we're say, um, give an example, like hard rock shirts. Like you get enough hard rock shirts that I can be like, you're getting a black hard rock shirt. It might be from Vegas. It might be from like uh, Singapore. New York. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter, but it's a hard rock shirt. So we can call that a static and take one picture for it. We're always Love looking it. for that because that allows us to like sell deeper into a skew. Right. Oh. And that's, that's the biggest, probably one of the biggest single most challenges with vintage and secondhand in general online is that, it outlabors itself to sell one of one items. And that's why there, there isn't a scalability in a lot of it. Like thread up, I guess is the one who's actually succeeded in, in doing that. But you, like you said, they've blown through like millions and millions of dollars, hundreds of millions, out, hundreds of millions trying to figure out how to make that profitable. Right. Yeah. And they also, so when they went public in their 10 K, Basically, you know, the report that they, this is for the audience, you know, yo, when they go, when a company goes public, 
and they raised you know three to five hundred million dollars before they went public. They said in their prospectus, like telling investors about what the company is, they said, "Yo." Obviously, they didn't say yo, but they said they will never, they have no idea when they will be profitable. And they still say, we do not know. We, have, You know, a lot of companies say, yo, in 2052, we're going to be profitable. ThreadUp's like, nah, B, we don't, we have no fucking clue. <laughs> and so, like, yeah, that's, that's the unknown world. That's the challenge of this shit. It's crazy. I mean, a lot of companies are like that. Like, isn't Uber still, uh, isn't Uber still like blowing through money? Yeah, I think and they're not Uber's profitable. Still- I think Uber might be still. I don't really follow the stock market. I follow, you know. The, uh, I just watched the Netflix show. It's super <laughs> like, sweet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, you know, like, Adam Newman is lit, though. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Uh, and you have it's it's these false valuations of things, but I guess the valuation comes into like us hoping that it's going to be profitable at some point. Yeah, it's well, but also world. you know, it's I wouldn't even say that it's a false valuation because like the because ultimately they do what can I say like uh Instagram was not making money when Zuck bought but that bought them for a billion bucks and everyone was like yeah Zuckerberg's a Zuckerberg <laughs> and it was like now this thing is printing like a billion dollars a second and so you know yeah true that's kind of why where these inflation uh uh these not the type of inflation that's happening right now but i'm saying inflate that's that's where these inflated valuations come from like oftentimes they do pay and when they pay ooh wee they pay big yeah so i want to talk uh, you know you talked a lot about the the rise of good fair and 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 your vision behind it and your thought process and it's important to well, I think a good subject is where is the value in a company um, like, say, like Goodfair? Like, where where does the mm-hmm. value lie to you? Um, and like, yeah. when you look That's at a- presenting that to like venture capital, like, yeah, like mm-hmm. what what is valuable to them? That's a great question. So this is the most important thing. And I tell um you know, the bid stitch squad, uh, you know, I don't, whatever. I tell London this all the time because I think that what they're building is so incredible. Um, and I say that the most important valuable swag goo goo gaga in this whole <laughs> game uh, is the community that you're building. Um, and so, like, in in the startup world, you know, there's this huge emphasis on CAC, which is cost of acquiring a customer, right? So it's like you pay Facebook fucking X amount of dollars, you get Y amount of dollars in, that's yours, your CAC a doodle do. Well, the thing that lowers your CAC the most is the repeat business. Um, and so you want to build that community around the people who are talking about you, talking with you. That's another reason why, you know, um, why I'm trying to always get press, why I'm always trying to, you know, uh, engage with the community on the gram, on TikTok, uh, you know, all these sort of things. I need to get on YouTube very soon. Uh, but that's where the value, that's really where the value is. And that's where, you know, giant corporations pay big dollars, baby. So like, you know, it's like a lot of times. All right. So I read some book, um, or listen to, I audibled some book, I don't remember, but one of them that basically talks about how a company gets purchased for a few different reasons. Like one of the main reasons is a company gets purchased is it, it um, is a larger company is threatened by their growth or something like that. So like you can make an argument that uh, Zuck bought Instagram because he saw, and WhatsApp, uh, because he saw, you know, the enormous user growth. And so he was just like, you know, peace, whatever, I'll pay whatever, I'm buying that. And that is often why uh, other companies, I'm not so sure how that works in retail, but it is my hypothesis that um, Goodfair will be acquired by a retailer who's wanting to be sustainable, uh, who needs to greenwash themselves a little, fucking bless themselves in our fucking holy ointment because they've got <laughs> slaves or they've got fucking 
you know, whatever, you know. Uh, yeah, you it's, know, it's, it's burning, not far yeah. off, man. Yeah, you mean exactly. you have? It's like yeah, like they either acquire you for that reason to like use you as PR to like sort of greenwash, like you said. They acquire you to dead you to be like we, we're just going to dead the competition, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. They acquire. There's like the hostile takeover where people can acquire as like a like a bully move when companies yeah. are in trouble. And that's often about like the those that moves often about kind of. Uh, uh, maximizing or kind of re- building up shareholder value or cash flow or something like that, where, you know, that happens to like bigger companies, less companies than like, like the early stage venture space. You so know, you mean like, like if a company car- wants to add like another hundred million to their revenue, they'll buy a hundred million dollar company just to show the, the shareholders they got more growth. That or so it'll be like some hotshot New Yorker um, like thinks that, Procter and Gamble, I'm using hypo, like hypothetical companies, is like has too many jets. Well, like they'll buy enough, uh, uh, like enough of the stock to get themselves a board seat to have enough uh, leeway with the board to say, yo, we got to sell those fucking jets. We got to fire this CEO. We got to fucking cut costs here uh, and raise revenue there. And that's how what we're going to do for for the shareholders. And that's kind of the general like theory behind um fucking hostile takeovers quick commercial break here this podcast is brought to you by bid stitch and easy okay if you guys want to check out the easy app uh we're starting to ramp up operations on there download it and uh we will be live streaming from durango vintage fest on the easy app so download it let's get this thing popping okay 24 hour live stream, Durango Vintage Festivus, but you've got to download the Easy app. Okay, check it out. Let me know how that goes. Uh, okay. So yeah, basically <laughs> what you what, you, what you've said about the value, I like, and you know, you're talking about the community and the value. We call that if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, that's the goodwill. Good fair has goodwill oh. of their, their community. Uh, their their platform, which they have the yes. ability to sell the product to the community. All your social mm-hmm. media outlets go into your your goodwill. Um, yes, I guess like you don't have to have. It's not about the clothing itself. It's about the system you've created, the goodwill, the community that's centered around what you're doing that has all the value essentially. Well, the product, like certainly creating the infrastructure to fulfill the orders at our scale and and all the processes that we've stumbled our way into figuring out have value. There's no question. But like there are people out there who went to fucking MIT and shit who were, you know, a hundred times smarter than me that could put it together a million times better than me. So, like, of course, we want to deliver the best experience possible. So that's really, you know, that's what creates all the kind of goodwill. But, uh, you know, so they, they, yeah, they feel yeah. So that and that and that's that's kind of another thing to mention to this vintage community. It's like most people have a business of some kind and whether that means like they're just thrifting and selling, it's still a business. But it's very grassroots, right? It's like the most grassroots business yes. you can have thrifting and selling your shit. Now, the problem is when you take yourself out of that equation, it doesn't operate because you're like, you know, the shit, you know, what sells, you know, what's working. So, so a huge thing about taking any like vintage or secondhand business to sellability is to be able to take yourself away. You got to be able to be like, can I go away from this company and it'll still work? Right. And that's like the systems that are set to make it work. So that's the that's a, to me that's like the number one question. Like, can you get yourself out of this company and the thing will still fucking work? <laughs> right now, <laughs> for good, you're like not no. at the moment. <laughs> Fuck no, I'm trying, I'm trying, and that's the whole thing. And like, uh, it's really about how. So, my favorite, favorite, favorite um, entrepreneur and kind of business guru is Ray Dalio. Have you heard of this dude? Yeah, Ray Dalio. Uh, I know the name. Refresh my memory. Okay. 
All right, so here's the dilio of Dalio. <laughs> he uh, started this fucking hedge fund called Bridgewater, and he took. He's like, it's like the most successful hedge fund of all time. But he wrote this book uh, called Principles, and it's the lens through which he sees the world. And I read this book and listened to it, and reading it for me was, I swear, like uh, an acid trip. This fucking guy sees the Matrix, and it's the most crazed like w- way of being able to achieve anything. Um, like I, I cannot, you know, sell this book enough to you guys because it like it's dry as a motherfucking bone. But when you get into how this guy uh, looks at things and looks at life, um you see that he's giving you a blueprint to, to build anything. And so uh, what he does to give you guys just a little bit of tasty taste um, of this is he believes in this thing called um, uh, believability based decision making. So, I mean, there's so much more to this, but one thing that I really love about uh, his steez is believability based decision making. So like, he grades his fucking um, employees on how believable they are in certain areas. And that's not saying like that they're fucking lying. It's like, yo, have you accomplished this thing we're talking about like more than three times? Like that's his benchmark. And like, if you have, then your believability is like higher than like the guy talking out of his ass who hasn't fucking done this thing. And so like, that to me was like a huge unlock because I always get lost in the sauce. It's like, yo, know, Billy said we should do this and Sandra said we should do that and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, okay, well, who's the most believable, believable in this circumstance? And so that was a big unlock for the kid. Not that I follow. I, I don't have the discipline to follow the shit the way this motherfucker does. I'm still fucking well, that's- lost and stumbling on my shit. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, uh, that's that's a super interesting concept. I'm going to totally read this book, and anybody listening should also you, you, fucking read this uh, book. Uh, but that's like believability thing is 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 uh, you know I talk so much about trust in my company. We talk about trust, and trust is, believability is trust. Essentially, you're trusting that what someone's saying they're going to do, they can do by their past uh, um, fucking endeavors or whatever they've done. Right? Yes. Now. So we like look at that in my company and we, we were always trying to build trust with you. And I, and I guess we're trying that I promote this for my staff to build trust with each other, but I'm also looking to build like the utmost trust with my people because I want them to be able to trust me so that I can, that they're showing the same like uh, commitment to me that I can trust them. Right. Yes. And totally. <laughs> like that's super important. And it's funny, like when you said believability, the first thing I was thinking about was like, motive, you know, like every company, you have to get up. I've, you have staff meetings, right? You have like a pretty large staff, I'm assuming. You have to like rally the troops essentially, and you got to get in the room and you got to like fire people up about what your mission is, about the tasks for the week, about like goals and shit. <laughs> and mm-hmm. you got to be All believable to them because it's like, it's like, yes, there's truth to it all, but there's also like, it's motivation is such a funny thing because you're trying to motivate these people and they got to believe that you're committed and you're going to make this fucking thing work and, and get them on the right path. And like, that's what I was thinking about, like believability, say like in like a, that kind of setting. But um, yeah, sounds like an interesting book, man. Yeah, Uncle Ray Ray really goes hard in the paint. But basically, was he the, I think was he like, the guy in 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 the Big Short? Sorry to interrupt. Was he the guy in the Big Short? Like, was no, he please. part of like the two thousand eight financial crisis thing? This guy, right so now, he yeah? did. Uh, he did. He did come out winning uh, in that. But I'm not sure if he was in the Big Short. But like oh, you know, okay. Bridgewater, fucking, yeah. you know, cleaned house because he was able to see, you know, predict because of historical looks back at like 200 years of fucking financial data. Uh, he's on some like looking back at like Roman times and shit. Like, wow. He goes, Arr. no, he's so <laughs> next level. It's, it's like beyond. 
he is a he is a walking god. I, like I really, I'm on this guy's jock. Like, <laughs> oh, okay, sorry, sorry to drop. Keep continue with your your next story. Though. Yeah. No, I don't even know what the book I'm talking about right now. Okay, so Where then I'll we? move, we'll move we'll move on a sec. Uh, yeah. So let's talk about that, like like staff and like you know running a company mm-hmm. of this size. So how many how many people you got? Uh, so we're da- well, we've we've had up to like twenty five. So we have thirteen right now. Like corporate okay, cool. Stuff. Like so, what are, what do you find some of the challenges? of like running a team that size and keeping every keeping everything organized and keeping people stoked and having like low turnover yeah. and like do you have thoughts on all that kind of stuff? You know, it's really interesting. I have a lot of thoughts around it and it's kind of um a lot of them I almost feel like I can't share. Um but let's just say That's like fair. uh it's a very, very weird time right now. Uh and things have gotten really freaking bananas um and uh uh you know i'll just say i love them all and uh uh you know work is hard and it's not always fun and uh i have a tendency to want to be a people pleaser and i'm always trying to please them and please investors and please everybody else to please the customer and all this sort of thing and the bottom line is like I have lost my way so many freaking times, and the only thing that you know continues to uh, uh, reap uh, benefits is just pleasing the customer first. And so I'll just kind of well, let's just leave it at that. Okay, um, <laughs> move along. So what what what's in the future plans for Good Fair? Like. Can you share some some thoughts yeah. about where you want to take it? All of it, baby, all of it. So, so the business is growing. We're in a good place, and you know, sustainability is becoming a thing. I think, like from a branding perspective. So, like last year at this time, my vision was to like really, really lean so hard into the whole sustainability thing. But it's so interesting because it opened good fair up to what has been what i refer to as the woke taliban and basically like it opened us up to like all right we're saying that we're sustainable well people on tiktok are like you know coming at us so hard about random things and it's just like you know what i'm tired of trying to like um be a hostage to this steez where i'm like we're trying to do good we're trying to stay close and I, let's fucking leave it at that. You know, we're not perfect. And like, we sometimes have to ship things in plastic and we do have to use the post office and FedEx and they burn fossil fuels. Hey, it's not freaking perfect, but we're, we don't have slave labor in China. Uh, and like, we're not pouring dye into rivers like, like most fast fashion brands. So we're trying to do our best. Um, so <laughs> that's me like venting a little bit, but um, so I stopped oh, leaning it, into it's this super relevant thing so hard. You stopped or you did yeah. lean into it? No, yeah, I, I I pulled back on the sustainability. Like, Good Fair is not just about sustainability anymore. And like, we really started marketing more towards, uh, you know, Good Fair is more for what we, you know, our data has shown is like it's more for like outcasts. And, you know, people that um, just don't want to participate in, you know, buying from, you know, going to the fucking mall or whatever uh, and just want the ease of shopping. And the fact that it's sustainability, that's a great plus, too. Um, But like I said, leaning into the full sustainability as our whole shebang orang a doodle all day uh, is just it's not me personally and it's not kind of where the brand is going. Yeah. Uh, I love that you said that, you know, that kind of brings me, I had, I'd written a note here about like core values and, and the mission of, um, mm. of any business, but your business in particular. So have you, have you done gone through the exercise and have you like identified like what those core values are? Yes. Yes. Of course. You know, one thing about, you know, when you take venture capital, you 
you do a lot of kind of playing house. So you do all the things that like, um, you know, and not to undermine these sort of things because they are certainly important. Um, but a lot of, you know, you, it's very easy to get swept up and lost in the sauce of all of the kind of like corporate theater that you're supposed to be doing. Um, and I'm not, I'm not saying that doing the values, you know, doing the values is uh, uh, corporate theater, but spending two days to fucking go on a corporate offsite, which is what we did uh, to kind of oh, no way. That feels a little bit much. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, totally. Well, yeah. Fuck, and they're changing. To that. And they're changing, baby. So, you know, like I said, I got, I'm got. i a people pleaser. I try to make everybody happy. And, uh, you know, it's. Uh, yeah. I, I'm working on that. Many, many, many years and thousands and thousands of dollars in therapy, baby. So, but. <laughs> well, there's, there's the, there's the uh, good fair profits into uh, the mental health. <laughs> Exactly. But I had an interesting shit. I had something else that I wanted to talk about around. Oh, so more on the direction of good fair. So we okay, want, yeah. we're trying to build a big business uh, and a meaningful business that that does good for the planet. Uh, that's that's really important. But ultimately, my dream is to eventually have brick and mortar. Um, we'll probably be opening a store in New York City uh, next year. Next winter is our goal. Um and, uh, uh, you know, I'd like to have brick and mortar in New York and L.A. and, you know, start with that. Uh, and then eventually. How, how would those run? Some, Can you, you speak know, to those a little bit? Would they be would they be like uh, like sort of an upscaled thrift or would it be bundles still or like what what's the concept of the retail? Yeah. So I think uh, the way we've been talking about it internally um, is. Uh, probably just have them more as kind of good fair billboards in the sense of like, you know, in good locations. Um, and so we probably be leaning into kind of better, uh, better stuff, uh, better products in, you know, Soho or something like that. So, uh, so it'd be a smaller store, you know, better stuff, some great teas, some great jeans and stuff like that. Because another thing is we've, we've developed some great buying power now as, as we sell all these mystery bundles. So it's like, well, we want to lean into that a little more. We can't sell fucking jeans. And it's like, that is a tragedy to me. And the reason why we can't sell jeans is mystery bundle sizing, like back to the dress thing, like, boy, we had them and they just upset customers. And it's like, oh man, we have such a, we have the potential to sell more, you know, to access more jeans than anyone in the fucking country. Like I, I, I really want to find a, a way to, to sell them. Um, and then like, you know, who I've heard does a great job. Just a shout out the vintage twin in New York city. Uh, they have this thing called a genius bar where they like hem your jeans, uh, you know, for you. And they just have vintage Levi's and things like that. I always think that was cool. I might, I might, you know, put a shingle up and sell, try to do that too. Right next door. Yeah. God bless. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we're, uh, <laughs> we're looking at that same concept. And I, I think, uh, obviously retail right now is doing really good, right? Because uh, post pandemic, yeah. everyone's like trying to be out and do, and they, they're, they're kind of like, they've kind of had enough online stimulus. They're like, let, let's go out and have real experience right now. Right. And like shop. So, for my for my take on it, retail is doing really well right now, and I think it will continue to do well. Um, Top, are you there? Yeah, I'm listening. Oh, okay. Sorry, your screen yeah, you weird for a second. Anyway, um, oh. and you know, I think like you said, a billboard, which is the concept of like using that mainly as like a major marketing tool for the brand itself. Then you you onboard mm-hmm. customers through the retail into the fold, right? Um, yes. Which you can tell the story really well of who you are, what you do through a retail, like immersive experience. They come in, they, your, your, your staff sort of teaches them and introduces them to the brand. Maybe they buy something, maybe they don't. Um, but you now have kind of brought them into what you do and hopefully they become an online customer from there on out. So you're really like using it as like an onboarding tool, or at least that's my concept of it. And I think it's a really viable. Exactly. That's it. Um, 
Yeah, it's it's great, and and if you can kind of uh, cash flow a little bit or, or break even, it's it's even better. So, um, you know, that's the plan. So our plan is uh, we want to eventually be getting into retail, and we're experimenting with uh, with manufacturing with some recycled fibers. So uh, that's a couple months away. Also, maybe for uh, you know next year. Um, just kind of seeing where that goes because back to the scalability thing, we've got this huge pent up demand and we're trying to, uh, you know, really feed that demand and how we can do that. Yeah. Smart. You mentioned repeat customer. Like it's a lot cheaper to have a repeat customer than to pay for one kind of in a previous, uh, thought process, oh, but yes. do you know what your, what your repeat <laughs> yes. customer base is. Like your percentage? I do. Yeah, I'm not. I don't share that stuff, but uh, okay. You know, it's pretty good. And basically, uh, you know, I'm so grateful for those repeat customers. There's a lot. There are a lot of tactics um, that can be used to kind of attract them back. But at the end of the day, it's there's two things that bring them back. Well, you can do all kinds of email and text message, coupon codes and referral rewards and all this shit. But that doesn't move the needle half as much as one, a great first experience and two newness. So those, that's kind of like retail uh, things that I've learned. It's like, you know, you've got to try to have new products, new, you know, new steezes, new swagoos to offer uh, these loyal uh, fans of, of yours. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, newness. So how do you, with good fare, create newness? Because you're just, you're, you're on a thrift bundle program. Like how does that happen for you guys? Well, that, that's just what I was talking about. So it's like, well, we tr we cut down our categories that we sell to about 30. So we try to re-release categories that will be meaningful. We do, uh, you know, we try to offer vintage one-off drops as much as possible. And then we also, um, try to, uh, uh, um, well, I think that's, that's about, oh, and then of course we, we're going to be experimenting with making some, uh, some clothes out of recycled fibers. I know it's a slippery slope, so we're going to be you know, really careful about that, but, uh, you know, that's how, what you kind of have to do. It's what, where the universe is pushing us. Yeah, I feel that. So interesting, you know, you're saying one off into drop. So I had a question here written on my, on my notes about mm. like, you guys are, you guys are, you guys are seeing more product than most people you're digging, you have mm -hmm. bales coming in all the time, or, or you're even situated in some of these factories and you're sorting a ton of product because you're shipping out a bundle. So every order is obviously more product than the normal company would sell. Now, do you, are your people trained to like find the, the crazy, crazy gems in those things or do they just slip into the bundles or how does that work? Yeah. So what's interesting is, and we're working on this, but um, basically in the rag house business and all this sort of thing, like I'm basically known as the biggest sucker in the game. And basically a lot of these recyclers <laughs> just send send us like we're working on this, but they have sent us such garbage that's picked over five zillion times over. And it's just like, all right, well, good fair needs this product so bad. They'll, they'll buy it. And so that unfortunately has caused us to not get great, uh, you know, some not get great bangers. Um, yeah. and we had to restructure basically how we bought, you know, really discuss with, um, other recyclers like you know the need for us to have unpicked material but um the short answer is at this point yeah we do pick most of them uh, the bangers out and that's kind of where what we're kind of supplying well we sell to nordstrom so uh we're selling to them and then some bangers go to them but also um we're stockpiling a good amount of them for our stores for our future stores Oh, okay. Cool. So yeah, so you are in Nordstrom. Tell us about that program. Like what, how did it do? Obviously I know I've talked to you about this off camera, yeah. but how is that doing? Yeah. And like, are they happy with the program? Yeah. So they're, they've got a really high sell through, uh, and we're just really working closely with them to figure out how we scale it because, you know, they've got a complex organization and there are a lot of moving pieces, you know, you know, like all the, 
uh, I's you have to dot and T's you have to cross. And I told you this off camera, I'm losing money on it. Good fair is losing money on it, but you know, we think that it will eventually pay off. Um, but, uh, you know, we've got a big dream for it and we just keep pushing. And yeah, yeah so they're the selling really like, high because the kids want it. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, it's, it's just to get in that door to see where that goes. The, it, it, you speak of, it's a big complex organization. It's so true. And, and, it's so complicated to sell to these people. So complicated. Like it's, it's almost a nightmare. You have to like figure out the fucking matrix to like deliver the product, how to label the product, how to, uh, how to send your invoice in. Like nothing is easy dealing with these companies. And exactly. And everyone is in a different department. So the person who you sold the product to is not who you shipped the product to. And, you know, and the person who you have to collect from is not the person you have to send the bill to. And all this sort of thing is just like, Oh, you didn't, you didn't read page 273 on the, on the manual that said, you know, the question, that type of question has to go to this type of person. It was like, no, I'm sorry. Please don't lose my business. Like, you know, all this sort of thing. I think little, Topper's going to read the, the manual. He didn't even, he didn't, Topper didn't even read the NDA. He's not going to read the fucking manual. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, man. Fuck. Yeah, it's, uh, we, it's trying to explain to these people who work in new fashion about our business. Like you're, 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 it's, it's, it's so foreign concept to them because they're like, wait a minute, you have, so you're telling me every skew is different, but it's a skew, but there's all unique pieces and how does this work and how do we market it and how do we put it on the racks? It's like, it's so complex to them because it is different. And that's again, going back to like, that's the fucking struggle of making yes. the used clothing business scalable and available to everybody. Mm-hmm. It is, but we're going to find a way. We're going to find a way. That's what we're here to do. That's the mission. <laughs> exactly. Um, so yeah, you said you scaled back on sustainability or kind of not, maybe not scaled back. You're doing the same thing, but you've kind of pushing it less to the consumer. Yes, exactly. I've had, I've had, uh, similar thoughts on this like you know like we said in the beginning like it was never the main main purpose or mission that we came out to accomplish we were you know come then most people in the business there's nobody out there in vintage who's been in it more than five years who'd tell you that they started in it to save the planet it's just not accurate <laughs> for the most part um but it's so funny when you look at it like people don't in my opinion, people don't really give a shit. They do like maybe 20%, but the 80% of where their decision-making comes in is like, is it fucking cool? Period. Does it, does it make me look good? Will I get laid wearing this fucking thing that I bought? Like those are the, the things that get, make people make decisions. And then yes, if they get to feel good about it, that is the bonus. Like you said, um, it's an extraordinary luxury to be able to care about the sustainability thing. And I think that uh, also Gen Z, uh, you know, God love you, is full of shit. It's like, look at how, look at Sheehan. You know, these are the, so it's basically like uh, Sheehan, you know, is doing $10 billion a year or more in revenue and being sold to the same people who are, you know, on TikTok talking about cancel culture and sustainability. It's, uh, very, very, um, it's, it's all a charade. It's all a charade and I'm over it. <sighs> I'm fucking over yeah, it. It's true. It's, it's so funny. And like we've experienced it just like you have TikTok. People love to slam shit on TikTok. You said like how that was happening with <sighs> you guys and people want to slam shit. And then it's funny too, because you know, you and me were seasoned businessmen, I would say. So, but the staff gets fucking fired up. At least my staff oh, would get so oh fucking God. fired up about it. Yeah. And then you have to like, you have to bring them down off the fucking bridge. You know what I mean? Yo, I can't handle those ups and downs. The, the chaos that had happened one time when someone came for us to cancel us on TikTok or everyone, you know, the shame involved and we're now going, you know, this person and the community, the TikTok community is coming after us. It's just like, no, I'm not going to kill myself over this. We're just doing our best. This is nuts. 
Like, there's got to be some kind of cra- like craziness pill that we can take to chill us out. I don't know. <laughs> chill pill, I should Yeah, say. no, it's fucking, it's so accurate. Um, and I've had that exact same experience. Like, it happens often where people get so fired up in the office about these little things that are happening. And I'm like, okay, like, we got to mellow out. Don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. And you got to know <sighs> that that person who's coming after Good Fair to cancel you literally probably just wants to go viral. Like they don't even care about good fare probably in that level. Exactly. That's, you know, I like, and also what's crazy is when, when we get canceled, we see an uptick in revenue uh, because people are coming to our site and, and then buying stuff because they can't resist the, you know, a cheap, uh, you know, thrifted product. So it's just like, very, very crazy. I don't. I certainly don't want to continue to get canceled all the time. Um, no. But no. But geez. yeah, it's that any press is good press mentality. You got to adopt that, and you also got to adopt the. Well, this was going back to that Uber uh, document. Well, it was like the dramatization Netflix series on the founder of Uber, but. You know, he was obviously a fucked up guy and did a lot of stupid things and was not a good boss to his employees. But, you know, in in that show, he delivered a damn good motivational speech. But um, one of them was like uh, talking about how, like, the city wanted to shut him down originally. You know, the cab industry wanted to shut him down. And he's like, we're the we're the disruptors like we fucking made it like the city's coming for us. You know, it's kind of like that, too. You can flip these things into like a. We fucking wow. did it. Like these people are coming at us and that's what we want. We want to be disruptors in the game. I mean, I don't know if that exactly relates to like TikTok getting canceled, but it's you can look <laughs> at these things in different lights, right? Wow. Well he yeah, he is lit. That is unbelievable. I gotta watch that. Um and I haven't had the, the balls or the confidence to to do something to you know try to flip the script like that. And because again, I'm always trying to please. Um, but man, I, I could use a little bit more of that. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. That, well, <laughs> if you're anything like me, that show will fire you up to go give it a, a good motivational speech. So definitely watch it. <laughs> okay. uh, <laughs> um, I mean, that's kind of a good place to end here. I think, you know, I, I that was a great chat. I, I appreciate everything you shared, man. And, um, that was so much I kind of just, I, yeah, I love Chad. We got to hang out. So your your, your Yo. birthday party is coming up here. Coming up. Are you going to make it down, uh, baby, or what? Your, your, it's your big 4-0, right? Am I right? Yes. Yes. Uh, it's October? No, September, next week. September. My real birthday it's is next 13th, week. But my, yeah, but my party is the 17th. Um, don't know if I'm going to make it, my man. <laughs> it's a bit of a trek, but I do appreciate. I do appreciate the no, invite. It is a oh, such a joy, man! I really, really can't wait to hang with you, and you know, can't wait for you to come down to H Town and you know, get into the rags. We're gonna be coming soon. We're gonna be coming soon, uh, and oh, I'm yeah. definitely gonna be hollering at you. I want to uh, just leave it with one last word. If you have any advice, uh, you know. Maybe like your one great word of wisdom or whatever of to give to the, anybody else out there who wants to be an entrepreneur or is on this path. Sure. So I would say um, the things that have served me are just and no matter what you're trying to build. I don't care if you're trying to build a time machine. Believe it. Fucking believe it. I don't give a rat's ass if. Who says it's possible? What says it is? How big the fucking vision is? Yo, fucking you believe that shit. Even if you don't believe it, you fucking tell yourself you believe it. <laughs> you're going to fucking build it. You put one foot in front of the other and you're going to fucking do it. Fuck the naysayers. Even fuck the naysayer that's inside yourself. Keep going. Let's do this. <laughs> my man. My man. Okay. Oh, he's getting fired up already. The motivational speech. Let's go. Enough. That's fucking Woo! awesome. Uh, okay. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate it, my man. Yo, thank you so much, Drew. So much fun. I can't wait to share this. Uh, and, and uh, yeah, it was great.
Well, thank you all for tuning in. Appreciate it. You know I do. You know I do. More episodes coming your way. Might even start doing some live episodes. I will keep you updated on that. Very, very exciting stuff. Again, if you want to support, go get on the Patreon. You can buy something from my website, F as in Frank, and I'm going to throw you out the code. It is VTGN stuff to get you 30% off. VTG. And stuff to get you 30% off, F is in Frank, vintage.com. If you must buy some crap from Amazon, use my link. That is a huge way to support me. Take money out of Bezos' pocket and put it in mine because you know he doesn't need any more money. That guy's loaded. Uh, although somebody did take over the richest man in the world position recently. So it's not Bezos anymore or Musk. Anyway, enough of that. Drew Heifetz, over and out. Vintage and Stuff podcast.